What I'll be talking about is how the FDA uses regulatory science to really fulfill our mission. And um, our mission is very broad. And um, oh, I have to do the disclaimer first. <laughs> My comments are an informal communication where represent my own best judgment, don't bind or obligate FDA. But a lot of people don't really realize the very broad scope and responsibility that the FDA has, but the products that we regulate represent 25 cents of every GDP dollar. It represents all of the foods as well as cosmetics. Um, we don't regulate meat, that's regulated by USDA, but all other foods are regulated by um, Center for Food Science and Nutrition. Center for Veterinary Medicine regulates um, products that are used to treat animals for veterinary medicine, with the exception of vaccines, which is done by USDA. Don't ask me how these things got distributed. And then they also do all animal feed, um, is also regulated by Center for Vet Medicine. And then, um, Center for Drugs, um, it, obviously people are probably most familiar with Center for Drugs because that's what's in most of your medicine cabinets or all the products regulated by them. But then we also have Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And this is, uh, you know, also a very broad remit. It, you know, it's everything from, you know, very standard, you know, um, simple things to, you know, much more complex devices. And, you know, now that we're moving into more and more um, of a mobile world, there's a lot of um, interesting complexities. Next-gen sequencing being used for um, diagnostic um, purposes of human disease, personalized medicine, precision medicine, whatever. Um, term you like to apply to that. Those are some of the cutting edge technologies that are um, being seen by that center. And then the center I'm in, which is Center for Biologics, and I'll be going into a lot more detail about what we do in, in CBER. But we have product, a product portfolio with a very large public health impact, all the blood, vaccines, and so on. And then our newest addition to our um, center is, this, or our agency is tobacco. And in the era area of tobacco, we um, now have the legal authority to regulate manufacture, distribution, and um, provide restrictions on certain additives that um, might be appealing to um, young people, um, new warning boxes, and so on. Some of you may have even seen the new ad campaign that the FDA has launched about you know, trying to dissuade young people from starting smoking. So our mission is to protect the public health, to assure safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, all the things I just mentioned, except this is an old mission statement because it doesn't have tobacco products. And we advance the public health by speeding um, innovations to make medicines more effective, safer, and more affordable, making sure that they get the public gets accurate science-based information to use medicine and food to improve health, and regulating manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of tobacco products, as I mentioned, especially with reduction of use by minors and supporting the nation's counterterrorism capability. Um, so we do all of this under a variety of different legal authorities. There are statutory authorities, which means these are laws that are enacted by Congress and signed into law by the president. And the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is sort of um, the, the grandfather of them all, along with the Public Health Service Act. And then more recent iterations of some laws that um, provide powers to the agency are things like FIDA, FIDASIA, the various user fee acts, and so on. But then we also promulgate regulations under these laws. These are really the agency's interpretation of what these laws mean, because as you can imagine, when Congress writes a law, it's still fairly broad, but we need to interpret it in a more detailed way. And that's in the Code of Federal Regulations. It's, um, and most of our uh, uh, regulatory um, regulations are in Title 21. I've listed just a few examples here. And then guidance documents are a really important tool for us because these are a way for us to represent to the industry that's being regulated our most current thinking based on the best available science. And guidance documents, unlike laws and regulations, which are requirements, guidance documents are not binding to either us or to the sponsor. So I, 
I don't mean for you to be able to read this slide, but this is really just to show, this is one example, Part 610, the General Biological Product Standards. It gives you a sense of the level of detail that's involved in a regulation. Um, it goes through all of the various things that need to be done as far as the product and the requirements that it needs to meet, labeling standards and so on. Um, and so this is just, you know, to give you a sense of the complexity. And what's challenging for us as regulators is that depending on the product, you may not actually have all of the scientific data and understanding and knowledge about a product to really address all of these aspects. And that's where regulatory science becomes a really important part. So in terms of kind of put it, looking at the big picture, the way the FDA approaches regulation of, for example, novel medical products is we have this umbrella of the legal framework and the regulations. But then we also, especially when you start talking about new areas of science, we need to have external discussion through advisory committees, open public workshops. We rely heavily on regulatory science, and I'm gonna talk more about that for the rest of this talk. Obviously, the data that's submitted to the agency is obviously an important component of information. And then we use all of that to have internal discussion to develop rational policy and decisions. At least that's our hope. <laughs> um, the FDA has defined regulatory science um, through as the development and use of scientific knowledge, tools, standards, and approaches necessary for the assessment of FDA regulated product safety, efficacy, quality, potency, and performance. Can hardly get through it <laughs> without a breath. And it's a very detailed definition, but it's also for most people not a very meaningful definition. So what I hope to do in the rest of this time is to convey to you really what this definition means. Um, and so one of the ways that I do that is through this graphic, which really shows sort of the major aspects of the regulatory component in terms of a, a new product, which is you need to be able to characterize your product, you need farm tox data, clinical protocol design and analysis, risk assessment, and then when it's licensed, post-marketing surveillance. But a lot of times, especially as you're starting this process with a novel product that's relying on new technology, um, you may not have all the information that you really need to be able to assess this, to make a decision about this going into humans. And so that's where regulatory challenges come up. Maybe you don't understand enough about the mechanism of action. Maybe there's not even a good animal model to be able to get proof of concept data or safety data. Um, you need to be able to um, understand what are the critical attributes of the product to measure? And so this is where regulatory science through a combination of both discovery and targeted development of new tools can start to address some of those gaps in our knowledge that we need to be able to make these very tough regulatory decisions. And that then informs the development of policy and regulatory decision making. As we get that kind of information back out to sponsors, then the idea is, is that sponsors who are developing these products have better data that they can submit to the agency that's filling some of these gaps and that we are in a place where we can um, really look at the benefits and the risk of a particular product and hopefully at the end of the day license a product that's going to have a positive impact on whatever the public health need is that, that gave rise to this new pathway. Some of the things that are unique to the FDA scientist who's um, a part of this machine is that, um, first of all, we know the kinds of questions that need to be answered. Secondly, because we're inside the FDA, we can see across a whole portfolio of products. So we may be able to identify gaps in knowledge that could advance a whole product um, class forward as opposed to an individual product. So I mean, obviously individual, you know, companies who are developing vaccine X are responsible for developing data to support the licensure of their vaccine. But if that vaccine platform is based on, you know, a platform that uh, could be improved, or for example, let's talk about TB where we still don't fully understand even what are the correlates of protection for TB vaccines and we want to develop new TB vaccines. That's the kind of work that we can do to kind of help push that whole field forward. 
So FDA has an intramural component and an extramural component. Um, and most of the examples I'll be providing to you today are really from our intramural research program. The extramural research has really just been, maybe in the last five or six years, been really expanding. And we do that through a broad agency announcement that um, provides contracts for specific projects and then the Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and, and Research, as um, Natalia mentioned. And we now have four, one of which is UCSF and Stanford. And the CERCES are really focused um, on advancing the field of regulatory science. And, um, helping to, uh, again, have more effective and efficient product development and evaluation. And in addition to that, the thing that's unique to, to the CERCES as opposed to, for example, the FDA intramural program is also the training and the collaborative piece, professional development and scientific exchanges.